Hello everyone, Kevin Stevenson here with GetMeTheGeek.com and this is part two of our series in OpenSense. We're going to do the setup wizard through the web interface this time and let's get started. Here we go. All right. Boom. Here is my OpenSense. That's right. Um, I'm sitting in the dashboard in the lobby dashboard, which is pretty cool and you can take a look right here and here it is. Now, if you were on our last version we set this up we installed the operating system via the console and did a basic setup uh, for using that now in this version i'm going to show you how to use the setup wizard which is probably how most people will use it so let's get started with that and i'll show you right here so what you want to do is you want to go down to system all the way down here to wizards let me make this bigger for everybody because Holy bigness. All right. So again, when you're in the lobby, you're logged in, you're probably at the dashboard. So you go over here down to systems on the left hand side, and then you're going to have wizard, right? That's going to take you to the general setup wizard. And so we're going to walk you through this and it'll be your first time setting up the open sets. Straight. First thing is the general information. So here's where you give it a host name, give it a domain and add a bunch of stuff like that. So OpenSense is fine. If this is your home machine, totally good. Local domain is totally fine too. You put whatever you want. If you have a domain, you want to use it on here, like give me the geek.com. You could, um, primary DNS is so you can, uh, set these here. I'm going to use 1.1.1.1, which is Cloudflare. And we're also going to use Google, which is 8.8.8. .8 you can use your ISP's um, DNS or someone else's, uh, but there are lots of them out there. I like these two because they're free and they work really well. So now overriding DNS, allow DNS servers to be override written by the DHCP server on the on the land. So basically um, what that is, is when your, um, when, if you have your WAN set up as DHCP, if, if you check this box, those primary and secondaries can be overridden by the DHCP server. So you can decide to leave that or not leave that. It's all up to you. Enable resolver. And you want to do this because the resolver is like, it's a DNS cache for you. So like, um, and that's going to make your, your general surfing faster because if you, if you go to Yahoo a lot, then it's going to remember that it's going to cache that address. Or if you go to steam or whatever, it's going to cache those addresses in there with the resolver and that'll make things faster because it doesn't have to go out to Google or go out to Cloudflare each time to get that. So this is a good thing. DNS sec. Now, honestly, this is pretty cool. Um, and basically it is a way, so DNS by default, port 53 is unencrypted, uh, plain text communications. So DNS sec is, is a standard that's going out to kind of lock that down and make it a little bit more secure. We're going to ignore that for now. Maybe we'll do a video on it later, but we're going to hit next. Okay. So here's what you have time servers. So if you don't know what a time server is, they're pretty, pretty simple. Uh, basically what that does is there are servers out there in the interweb that keep track of time. They're called NTP servers. Uh, so your, your Windows PC, your Linux boxes, everything pretty much uses them. They go out there and they sync the time down. So you have a Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have a real-time clock battery or anything built into it. Every time it reboots, you have to it has to go out to the internet and get the time. Uh, so that's what this does. So these servers in here that you can see are all the open sense ones. And you can tell that they're separated by a space. Uh, there are lots of lots of NTP servers out there in the world. If you don't want to use open senses, you can use someone else's. Okay. Then you want to pick your time zone. So uh, my particular time zone, I'm in the central time zone in the United States. So let's scroll on down here and find that. Let's, let me just minus this because it's a little bit too big for me to. So, all right. So probably America, Chicago will be what you show up for us. 
uh, typically. That will give us the central time zone. And you hit next. You you you're gonna pick whatever time zone you're in, and that'll make uh, the time appropriate for you. All right. So here we are in the WAN interface. So if you have a static IP address, you're gonna want to put that information in here. So you go down here, you change this to static, and then if you scroll down just a little bit, then you're gonna get that put that static IP address in there. You. It's not as common as it used to be, but PPOE. Is also an option you see a lot of. Um, see, that was like DSL back in the day. A lot of times it was PPOE. You can you can take your DSL modem and, and move the PPOE connection to your firewall router, and then it gives you a little bit more control. Um, but in this particular case, we're going to use DHCP because I actually have the WAN interface connected to my local, my regular local LAN, so it's, it's, it's going out. So it's just going to actually give you a local IP address. From the DHCP, which is the way we had it before. Um, but in your case, a lot of internet providers, uh, especially on the residential side, are DHCP. They hand out your public IP address. So this is going to cover most people with a home network. And when you get to the business networks, a lot of times people will have static IP addresses. And that's because you need to host things or like a VPN server and things like that, where you, where it's kind of better to have a DH or better to have a static IP address. So moving on, we're going to leave that at DHCP. So it's going to get that IP address. And that makes, when you go down here, see all this is grayed out now, right? Um, we can ignore this. And so down here, if you had that PPOE, this is where you fill out the username, password for all that stuff. PPTP uh, is, is, also similar. So what I want to point out to you right now is that uh, this RFCs uh, 1918 is blocking private networks um, so from entering in the WAN. So um, this is this is something you want to have checked normally. Um, and then block non-entered routed networks from entering the WAN too. So these, both these two things are checked by default and you probably want to leave them that way. Um, if you come into a situation where you do need to change that, well, um, then that's something you can research on your own. We'll come, if you have questions about that, go ahead and drop me a line in the, in the, in the here, uh, in the comment section, we can talk about it. So next up is the LAN. So this is your internal network. And by default, you're going to get this 1.192.168.1.1. So one thing I'm going to recommend is that you never use this, never use this 1.1, and never use this one. The reason why is because the vast majority of networks that are fired up when you go buy a router from from a Best Buy or, or your local uh, provider of hardware, Amazon, whatever, it's you're going to set it up. It's going to be a 1.1 address typically or a 0.1. And so if you do VPN connecting networks together, you're going to get things. It's going to be common to step on the networks. And so if you have a, a, your home network is 1.1 and then your work network is a 1.1, when you VPN connect those together, you cause this routing problems. And there are ways around that. But generally speaking, you want to avoid it. So pick a random number between zero, between two and 254 and put it in here. So we're going to use the survey says 21. All right. So subnet mass. So this is going to be how many IP addresses do you need in your range? Uh, so you can go ahead and you can look up uh, subnet mass and CIDR, CIDR notation for that. So the slash 24 is going to give me everything from 21.1 to 21.254. So that's going to be 200 and some odd addresses that's available for you to use in your home network or your business network. And you can reduce that. And stuff and you can actually well you can actually 
so you can reduce that um, and everything. So the, the bigger the number, the less IP addresses. Now, we can just Google that. Um, you know, type in a CIDR calculator, comes to something like this, and 192.168.21.1, and we do the 24, and calculate it. So that's 255.255.255.0. And so you'll see here in this, this is your actual IP address range, right? So we're gonna leave it that, change it to 21. We're gonna hit next, right? Now, this is where they're gonna ask you to change your password. So I've already set a password on this, but please do not leave it at the default OpenSense password. Make up your own, make it a good solid password, use a password manager, you will thank me later. All right, so we're gonna leave it empty because we're gonna keep the current one because I've already changed it obviously. And then we're gonna hit reload. Now, before I hit this, you'll notice up here that my IP address is 192.168.1.1. Now, because we changed this, this is gonna turn to 21.1 when it reloads. So let's hit reload. What this is probably gonna do is it's going to save that configuration, reboot the, the OpenSense and be back up and running. So, okay, so that's rebooted now. It's all updated. So let me just show you. So we go to the details and you'll see that I have a 21 subnet IP address now. All right, so we'll close that out and you'll see that the, the router has re, rebooted. I'm at the 21.1. We're gonna log in again. And here we are, logged into our router, and boom. So you'll look down here, you'll see that here's my WAN DHCP. You can see that's a, a, a 172 internal IP address. So not a public IP address because of I am actually routing it internally. So, and you'll see down here in the land area, land area, which I need to bring it over here. <laughs> So you see the LAN down here is all set at 21 and the WAN DHCP is all set there. Okay. So that is the wizard. I want to leave you with one last thing and we're going to go up here and notice that like updates, updates are right here. So you can click on view pending updates and go through your update because updating your router is very important. So going through this, now this is updating all the BSD packages that are in there and all kinds of stuff here. So howdy, hello there, and here's all your stuff about uh, uh, changes, full patch notes, and all good stuff here where you can read through this, CFS pulls, loopback changes, blah, 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 all this good stuff. Feel free to read all this. Um, What's really important here is that you'll see note that, that it's fixing the CVEs. Uh, so those are vulnerabilities that have been reported and that needed to be patched. So very, very important. Libre SSL security audit database. Uh, so those are those are those are the things that you want to, those are the reasons why you do these updates on a frequent basis. Now, always be sure to make sure that you can allow for some outages when you do these things and always back up your, your device whenever you can. So we're gonna hit close and all that good stuff. So you can click update here. Now there are 20, package, 20 packages updatable and it will require an update. Uh, it will require a reboot for that. I'm not gonna install those right this second because why? Well, I didn't do a backup. If I lose everything, I need my configuration back again, right? <laughs> so let me just show you that real quick, okay? Right over here. And let me make this just a little bit bigger again, all right? I, I shrunk it down a little bit, but right over here under systems, under configuration is backups, right? So here's where you can pull your backups. So do not back up our RD data. So that, that's okay to, 
so if you do that, if you do uncheck that box, it makes your backups really big. So, and it, it's a bunch of data that you probably don't need anyway. So you can encrypt this file. Always good if you have sensitive stuff in there you want to make. So encrypt that file uh, or, and keep that password somewhere. What I like to do is I take this configuration and I download that file and attach it to my password manager that keeps the password to my uh, router. And that way, if I need to restore anything, because I'm going to go in there and look at the password, everything gets borked up and I got to reinstall. I can, I, I have it all right there and it's all a nice database. So here's the restore area so you can do that. And here's a really cool thing that you can do in OpenSense is you can back that up to Google Drive. So you may want to consider that, but just remember, if you back something up to Google Drive, absolutely 100% make sure it's password protected because Google Drive can be compromised. It is out there. Uh, it, and, and Google Drive itself isn't, I believe it's encrypted at rest, but when is it ever at rest, to be honest? Uh, so you have to worry about be, being hacked or compromised and access to that. So just keep that in mind if you're going to do this. So download the configuration, boom. And so here's where we got keep it. <clears throat> and, and so then you're going to get this XML file. So store this config XML file somewhere that's safe for you. I recommend putting a password on it um, that way which is encrypt this file, put a password, and then download it. Keep that password somewhere safe. Keep that file somewhere safe, because that is your backups of it. So that's what you want to do for that. All right. That is all there is to doing the setup. So we went through the setup wizard. I showed you how to do a backup, and now you're up and running with your OpenSense. Stay tuned for part three where we'll do some even more interesting things with OpenSense. Uh, if you missed our first part of the series, go back and get that where we installed the operating system. So if you're like, hey, if I need to know how to install this, go check that out. You can do that too. So if you got something out of this video, please like and share this. Go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you want to know more. Know more. I appreciate you guys coming in here, watching my video. Uh, I have a buy me a coffee link. You can do that. And... I don't mention this much because I haven't really got it off the ground much, but you can actually, um, in addition to subscribing, you can pay for the membership on my channel, which is $1.99. And that will jump you into access to a Discord channel, which we have, which will allow you guys to talk to me and my people a little bit more freely. So uh, many people ask me questions on the channel and the comment section is less than ideal to be able to answer some of these questions. So I set up this membership, uh, which will give you access to the Discord, and then we can have a little bit more uh, in-depth conversations in there. So if you're interested in that, if you want, you wanna, you wanna, you know, pop me up some questions and things like that. I mean, it, obviously it's not full support, but, but if we wanna have a conversation, talk about your configurations, things like that, join the, join that membership, $1.99, get you in the Discord channel, and we can have conversations there. Uh, and we can maybe even talk through some of your issues you're having with these things. So check that out. Thanks for joining me. I'm Kevin Stevenson. We'll see you next time.